Hey everybody, hey everybody, we are live. We are live. It, is, uh, it is James, uh, James and Jacasso and, and Matt Colville here. here. Uh, we're going uh, to be taking, your, taking questions your questions about the MCDM RPG, RPG which is currently which is on, uh, on Backer uh, Kit. Uh, and uh, and uh, just want to give a huge, huge thank you to everyone for their support so far. Um, we have uh, funded. It's pretty exciting. We uh, went through two stretch goals uh, yesterday, so this is uh, really, really incredible. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. Matt, how are you feeling? <laughs> <laughs> I feel I feel great, James. Thanks, thanks, friends. Um, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. If it's um, it's um, the 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 thing is like the game doesn't exist yet, right? It's in playtesting, so for us, seeing the number go up is really cool. But it just means now we got a lot of work to do. So that's 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 where my head is. My head is like, okay, p the people believe. Like there's there's a certain kind of like celebratory atmosphere around this, which is awesome, obviously. But uh, some of some of that celebratory atmosphere is like tinged with, it's like the game exists. Like people are celebrating mm -hmm. as though the game exists. Not yet, it doesn't. We got to make it, right? So that's <laughs> so that's what I see when I see that number go up. I'm like, oh damn, now we really got to do this, <laughs> right? So when the game comes out, I'll be a lot more celebratory. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Hello, hi. Oh, there was an echo. Call because you can hear. Me and James? Yes, yeah, we might have been. Yeah, James was coming through Matt's mic, so I had to mute Matt's mic, so we'll need to reposition the mic in between the two of you guys. Okay, no problem. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so Jerry's going to probably come out here in a second. Um, oh. Now people can see the power of that mic I use on my live streams. Is that it can't, it's hardly picking me up at all. Oh, wow. Yeah, so when we used to stream like the chain of Akron, each each person at the table had one of those mics pointing at them. So now uh, we don't we've completely changed our setup. We haven't streamed anything here in years. So now we only have one mic. There are other mics around here. It's just they're far away. Mm -hmm. um, no, we're not Jean Philip Terrett. We're not using our. Well, there's an actual microphone here. We have we have multiple <laughs> microphones. Yeah. Um, welcome to your first live stream, Dima Jadar. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, that was Jerry, by the way. Those of you who are new to the MCDM community slash ecology, that's our uh, director of IT and the person who sets up all the cameras and microphones and makes the live streams work and any mm -hmm. of our like code names, games, or any stuff we did. Uh, Jerry does all the work to make it so that you can understand what we're playing and does all the Chiron and everything. Uh, I saw that Bort NM. My son is also named Bort. Uh, thanks for the five bucks. <laughs> um, it is. It is exciting. We are excited. Yeah, we funded really fast. It's funny because I had no idea how fast it was going to happen, and it went like uh, that. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, okay." People really believe. People really believe. Um, oh my gosh, it's a leg. It says guys, it's just amazing what you're going to be able to accomplish with the game you're making. We'll see. We'll see. Like it's it's not real until it's real. Right now, like I said, right now it's in testing. James is working hard on a uh, packet for the patrons, mm -hmm. um, but we got a lot of stuff. We got a lot of stuff to do. Um, yeah, we really do. It's a it, it, it's incredible knowing th there's sort of this thing that happens when you're getting ready for a crowdfunder, which is you do as much work as you need to to get ready for the crowdfunder, and uh, you're preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, and it, those are different things in different situations, right? Yeah. But it's like we didn't want to go full tilt and totally complete the game if it wasn't something that people wanted. Well, now we know it's something people yep. wanted, so we got to make it, like Matt said. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do now, which is great. It feels really good to, uh, you know, be able to start working with freelancers and things like yeah, that. Yeah, like before the before the crowdfunder went live, James was already contracting folks to start working on converting monsters from flea mortals. So mm -hmm. we were we were James and I were acting like this is you know because we have we have a big Patreon with people who want to see this game happen. So it's like whether it funds or not we're gonna make the game it's just how much art is it gonna have is it just gonna be me and james working on it right? <laughs> right right like we were gonna figure out a way to do it because there are enough there are enough patrons to cover like me and james's time but now 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 we can do a lot now we can do a lot i yeah. saw somebody in chat who had a name i could not pronounce it looked like uh, stop somebody somebody it looks like from brazil oh uh stop playing Baldur's gate 3 for the stream me too <laughs> uh Meroveo says, "I was sold when I heard about the shadow." Um, yeah, I gotta, I gotta steal a line of dialogue from a piece of League of Legends fan fiction at some point. No man can escape his shadow. Yes. Um, how about? Yeah, we're not. Unfortunately, pwned like whoa. We are not soliciting. <laughs> we are not soliciting names. We're perfectly ca capable of coming up with weird, <laughs> janky names on our own. Um, do we have an estimate for the Patreon packet delivery? That's an actual question, Sean Huckle. I mean, yes. Sometime this month, we hope. That's that's what we hope. So. Yeah. 
Um, we're, we're hard at work. In fact, it is uh, with an editor right now. Um, so we're, it, we're in a pretty good spot to be able to try to hit that deadline and get it to y'all. Um, so, but best laid plans and all that. So, but that's what we're looking for. We're, we're targeting the this month. Uh, Shalakor says, I haven't even joined the crowdfunder yet. Probably won't until after Christmas. I think that's probably true of a lot of people, mm -hmm. frankly. And the good news is, I had to say this a lot in the video, but now it's just a reality, that if you haven't backed yet and you're like, and cash is tight, but you're interested, that's that's fine. It's it's going to happen now. It's quite evidently going to happen. You'll be able to pre-order once the backer kit uh, thing closes. You'll be able to get in. You'll be lots of opportunities for people, for people to get on the bus. Um, mm -hmm. uh, here's a question. Uh, if armor and kits give you things like HP, how will magic items work? That's what the Dave wants to know. It's a really good question. Um, and so essentially, think of this, right? Your kit is your loadout. And when you have a magic item, that it works with your kit, right? So your kit might allow you to wear heavy armor or wield a pole arm weapon, right? And if you find a magic pole arm, you can use it with any kit that uses a pole arm, right? Um, if you find a, a magic suit of scale mail, you can use that with any kit that allows you to use heavy armor. And what that does is it will probably just improve the quick, your kit, right? So it's like, hey, when you're wearing this, you also get another yeah. 10 health, yeah. right? Um, and that's that's how that'll work. In addition to then doing some cool magic thing like growing wings out of the back or or that sort of thing. Yeah, you can imagine uh, ma you can imagine magic power, a magic item, like a magic weapon that mm -hmm. has its own cool power. Right and did its own thing, and it just as long as your kit says, uh, "I'm a heavy weapon kit." If that magic item says it's a heavy weapon, then you can use it with your kit. Yeah, and in fact, if you want an example of this, there is a magic yeah. sword. Yeah, uh, and there are kits in the preview pages, so you could go check them both out, and it should be obvious how they would work together. So yeah. there you go. Now I, you know there's a lot of work and development left to be done. We need to we need to develop a lot more classes, a lot more customization. So how kits function is I'm sure going to evolve over time. But the core idea of kits is that it's a preset bundle of stuff. I don't think that's gonna change. Kits are, I think kits are real. Yeah, kits are great. Um, can we talk about how the Necromancer has, a, I don't know how to pronounce that word, so I don't know what that is, a fave in his hand? The preview art did not have to go as hard as it did. Yeah, we're really <laughs> lucky, the artists, the artists that we work with, uh, folks like Patrick Hell, obviously our staff artists like Grace, Grace Chung, uh, Nick Despain, mm -hmm. Jason, what's his name? Jason Halfenauer. Uh, <laughs> are astonishingly good. We are incredibly lucky to work with these folks. Um, oh, wow. Um, so there's a good question about, uh, uh, looks like we're getting questions about support for other uh, tabletops and stuff. So you know that we are working on our own VTT, um, that that is one of the stretch goals that we've hit. Um, however, uh, we are going to have open uh, uh, rules. That's another thing Matt talked about in the announcement video. Yeah. So any VTT is welcome to use those rules and they will be welcome to create support on their platform if they so choose. People are throwing us money. I see that from Boris um, who likes our reasoning for why it's just two core books. <laughs> in the, I mean, if, yeah, that's, that's the books we think we need to make in order mm -hmm. for this to be a fun, playable game. Uh, Don Russo, I saw that. Thank you. Uh, Aiden Birch, thank you. Um, can you, can you multi-class in this game? No. No. You can't play a shadow talent. However, we, if you look at the, if you look at the talent, for instance, if you look at the Illrigger, the Illrigger revised, which is available now, especially if you already bought the Illrigger, you should be already have an email for it. If you bought it on our store, uh, it's just a free update at that point. That we often like instantiating subclasses that give a class a lot of different ways to be that class. So, like with the tactician, we already had a meeting about, you know, could you be a stealthy. Um, roguelike tactician and it's like yeah you would probably take this subclass of tactician right this kit and this career or past right like spy and you put those three things together and now you can be a stealthy shadowy tactician but if you want to actually be a tactician that can do hesitation as weakness no that's about niche protection and it's about doing it's just like our game it's about doing one thing well right and uh so being able we're huge we're huge bears for customization like we oh, we, yeah. we love being able to put characters together in lots of different ways so that even two dwarven tacticians could be really different from one another depending on their kit depending on their past um depending on their subclass uh and then stuff like ancestry and upbringing you could be really unique that's the goal but we don't like the idea of kind of trying to take two different clear archetypes and then kind of junkily 
blend them together into this mush, right? Mm -hmm. And then both of those classes now have to be redesigned to be legal to sub to multi-class. And that's that was our experience working on fifth edition classes, and it was awful, right? The fact that you could multi-class in fifth edition meant there are better designs out there for the ill rigor, the beast heart, the talent that we couldn't do. Because it's like, well, we could do this, but then it breaks the talent if you multi-class. And then it's crazy because the Seattle company comes out and they're like, here's what our data shows about how many people multi-class. It's like heart, not that many people, right? But it's if you're online, it's a big part of the discussion online, right? Uh, and so it, it's, it gets into weird, gross places. So no, you'll be able to really heavily customize your character so that you can, you don't have to be, a tactician doesn't have to be a heavily armored person, but you cannot literally blend classes together. Yeah, there's a, a good question about how do you switch between kits. Um, you can switch between kits when you rest. So if you're resting and you think, I have the Shining Armor kit, I would really like to have the Panther kit instead. When you take a rest, you're able to do that. Now, a rest for us is a uh, like a good 12 hours, right, that you are um, stopping at least. And so the idea of that is not only are you, like, getting out new equipment, you're reminding yourself how to use it, right? Like, oh, right, this is how... Uh, this is how I would use a trident because I've been using a longsword for the last three days And so I need to sort of warm up with it and remember and these are the fighting techniques I need to adopt and that kind of thing. So that's why it takes uh, a rest to do that Kits are quite literally just a proficiency list gauge frisbee says uh, mm. That sounds kind of trollish. So I'm gonna move on <laughs> um, Yeah that 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 kind of that kind of we get a lot of that kind of attitude of like oh it's just this game with this other thing why would you bother doing that it's like all right well that's your attitude knock yourself go go play that game knock yourself <laughs> out um, if you're happy if you're happy with the a la carte weapon and armor thing mm -hmm. from D20 Fantasy guess what there's dozens of games out there that that's how it works you got plenty of options what are you doing here mm -hmm. um, what a, that feels really good to be like what are you doing here like that's not the <laughs> game we make you want to talk there's dozens of people out on their online talking about those games knock yourself out. Um, if an attack, uh, Andre Russo asks, if an attack cannot miss, mm -hmm. how do you narrate a realistic fight where no one ever misses and does zero damage? Uh, you know, it's surprising when you're focusing on a heroic fantasy game how you don't, you don't miss narrating these non-dramatic moments of nothing happening. Actually, mm -hmm. you, I would rather spend my time as a director narrating the, narrating the progress both teams are desperately making, trying to trying to be. Remember, there's the bad guys. The bad guys get a vote when, mm -hmm. in a battle, and and focusing on did you do a lot of damage or a little damage? Did you make a lot? I said this in the video. Did you make a lot of progress or a little progress? Are you making progress faster than they are? There's plenty of dramatic uh, stuff, and the fact that no one sits around for a, a turn doing nothing. You know, uh, we don't have a, a bleep, and I don't want to get gross. You know, doing nothing mm -hmm. um, is not something any of us miss. So if that's something you miss, if you're like, no, 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 the only way I can have fun is if 35% of the time my players and my monsters sit around doing nothing, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I refer you to my answer to the earlier, the earlier question. Uh, there's a good question about um, if you're only rolling for damage, does this mean PCs will have meat sponge levels of HP? They are going to have higher... Um, health than you've seen in a typical tabletop RPG, but not higher than you see in a game like, let's say, Diablo. Yeah. Um, and not as high as a game like League of Legends, right? Well, yeah, because those games, yeah, because those games are modern games and they don't have a 1974 built-in 35% mischance. And mm -hmm. I did a video about this. You guys can go watch the videos. It's like, if, if you're going to do... If you're gonna if you're gonna miss thirty five percent of the time, and that means you're avoiding, let's imagine you're avoiding eight damage each time, right? You could do the math to figure out well how do we how do and we could have done that. We could have said, look, here's a less fun way to play mm -hmm. this game where you'd miss thirty five percent of the time, but we found a more fun way where we just mathematically adjust it, and everyone's making progress all the time. And then the issue is, are you making a lot of progress or a little? It's really straightforward. Um, I'm getting the sense that there's a lot of like, how on earth could you possibly make the game mm -hmm. you're making? Right, it's like, well, that's that's not, that, yeah, that we are it, 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 we are already playing it. It is already fun. People, you can there's go into the Discord. There are people already talking about it. Um, so I, we're probably going to focus not on those questions that are like, how dare you make a game that is fun? Why aren't you making? How am I possibly going to narrate this? How am I? How how are we going to? It's like it's already working and it's fun. So we're I'd rather focus on the stuff that um, the, p the questions about the actual game rather than questions about the game that is not. Mm -hmm. Um, how about thoughts on a digital marketplace for third-party content? Um, yeah, we, we believe in that very strongly. We'd love to do that. We That's believe in great. that very strongly. 
Um, although I think technically with the license we envision, you wouldn't need to use our marketplace. There's not going to be any requirement, I think, in the license that you, if you want to make something for our game and charge money for it, that you have to use our marketplace. I don't think it, I don't think it'll work like yeah. that. If, um, if we could find a way, though, to uplift people who are making stuff for yeah. us, I think we'd love to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Doesn't have to be on our platform. Doesn't at, not at all. Uh, we'd be perfectly happy to shine a light on people and, and other places making dope stuff for uh, for this community. Uh, Adam Gross, 10 pounds, thank you very much. Excited to be along for the journey. I am also excited to have you along for the journey. Uh, to support different character types, do you think you'll have lots of different classes with a few subclasses or vice versa? It's a good question. James, yeah. what do you think? I think ultimately we like making classes, and yeah. I think you'll see us make a lot of classes, and those classes will have subclasses. We had a whole meeting about this this yeah. week uh, while I was here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the plan is that probably in in the core you may you're not going to see every class, but we're going to continue to make more oh, classes yeah, sure. for this game. I mean, there will be classes I think probably that are done and finished and playable that just don't fit in the core rules, mm -hmm. and so the patrons will get those classes, and then inevitably at some future point. Um, there'll be another book. I, hopefully, I mean, yeah. assuming assuming that the audience for this grows over time, you know, I was already saying as soon as I saw that we funded, I was like, we got if if, um, if Jeff is listening to this, make a note. Um, I, I was cleaning off my keyboard. Jeff's not in the computer. <laughs> uh, if uh, if Jeff's listening to this, make a note um, that we definitely got to go to Gen Con this year, and we need to have events, right? People, we need to have tables of people playing the game and volunteers, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. That's a big part for us for organized play. Um, so yeah, we want. Lot, we, there, I'm sure we're gonna have, you know, we focus on classes. That's our core, like fa the core fantasy engine for the game mm -hmm. is. Oh, you know, it'd be a cool idea for a class, right? And then we think about, you know, is that sufficiently distinct from the other classes we have? Is that how how core is that? Should we like, you know, for instance, the operator is not remotely core. We just had a, an idea, and then at a certain point, I got the bit between the teeth and I prototyped it, <laughs> right? And so, you know, and we we haven't tested that yet, by the way. But that's the thing we like doing. And then we focus on that class and we think, what are all the different fantasies inside that class? Like like we did with the tactician. Like, what are the different fantasies? And that's where we discovered, like, that's probably where the archer should live. We'll find out. We could be wrong, right? We don't have a prototype for this yet. But in the meeting, we were like, okay, these are the different, these should be the different subclasses of tactician. And we just sat and thought, like, what, what, where is the archer in this game? Like, we, that's a really strong fantasy and you should be able to do it. And we're like, well, a shadow maybe? I'm like, you should be able to be a ranged shadow, but that's not the same as an archer. And we're like, is it its own class? And I don't think either James or I thought the fantasy was a, a, a robust enough one to support an entire class. But we just started thinking about maybe it's a tactician class. What would you be able to do mm -hmm. as an archer or tactician? To be a little bit more like a, um, a commander, like a, like, um, you know, doing area denial and stuff like that. The fantasy of being able to shoot, be, make multiple attacks at first level. <laughs> and I said stuff like, um, you know, what if... Everyone else is rolling 2d6 when they make their attack. What if the archer tactician has an attack that attacks multiple people, but it's only 1d6, right? So I roll 1d6, I add a number, and I attack all those people. And then there could be riders on it. Imagine the archer tactician seeing Boromir surrounded by orcs. goes With one action, goes, and all of those orcs get knocked back. Right, they don't take a lot of damage. They take a little damage, but they get knocked back. That's a that's a very tactician thing, right? I didn't just do some damage to a lot of people. I changed the battle, the shape of the battlefield by freeing my ally from being overwhelmed. Um, that's that's how we think. So that's mm -hmm. the process, right? As we start with the fantasy, and then we start to drill down, and we see what's the anyway. Yeah. Uh, Pedroid says, uh, keep up the great work and awesome art style over at MCDM. Can a single class fulfill different roles based upon subclass choices? We talked about that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. We're a big fan of, like, we don't want somebody to be... I think the fantasy comes before the role. James yeah. will correct me if I'm wrong. Like, we start with the fantasy, and then we try to think of what role is that. Correct. Right? And then once we've got that, like, dialed in, then we start thinking about what are the different ways you could be this class. W you know, if you go and you check out the talent or the ill rigor or the beast heart, there, you could have, you could very easily run an entire party of some of these classes. Like, uh, with the, with the ill rigor, you have a stealthy ill rigor, you have a tanky ill rigor, you have the wizardy area control area denial ill rigor, stuff like that. It's really cool. Uh, Jonathan Francia, $10. $10. Any chance of additional copies of the Ajax edition being offered? I will tell you, I really did not think. Whatever my, whatever, <laughs> whatever I thought about the success or failure of the crowdfunder, I did not think we were going to blow through all of the Ajax editions in like eight minutes or something ridiculous. No. Yeah, yeah, that was very, it was within two hours we had, we had sold them all. It was wild. Yeah, uh, somebody says, Paton says, maybe both work. I could see an archer shadow as some kind of sniper. We actually have a kit in the mm -hmm. game called the Sniper Kit. Yeah, but that's a different fantasy. That's, that's what I was saying. I was like, yeah, no, no, the you should be able to be a ranged shadow, but that's a different fantasy, right? The different, that's the fantasy of, that would be like a find weakness character, right? Where I watch this person, uh, and every, every round I watch them, 
I'm investing in greater damage mm -hmm. later. And so at a certain point, I can do like a headshot, right? Where I do one shot, it's a ton of damage, but I had to invest in it. That, that's the sniper fantasy. Um, Definitely. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we should be able to support maybe more than one kind of archer. Yeah. Um, so that's where it becomes a question of like, is this a class? Is this a subclass? Yeah, and every time we do that, we, we cleave off some percentage of the audience that that's what they want. Right, so it eventually becomes diminishing returns, right? Where it's like, well, there might be another archetype here, but is it worth us investing in when we already just got 87% of the people who want to play an archer with the tactician archer, right? And then you cover the shadow range character and then you're, you, you say, that's enough, that's done. There might be other fantasies out there, but they get more and more niche if we do our jobs right. Um, I saw that, Flama77, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can you explain the negotiation mechanics a bit more, James? Yeah, so the way negotiation works is uh, you're, you're talking to someone and they basically have two stats, right? They have a patience, um, which can start pretty high, and they have an interest, um, which generally starts low. And they have to, when you are talking to them, you are making arguments to them. If those arguments appeal to their motivations, right, they have usually at least two, but sometimes three, four, five more motivations, right? If an argument appeals to one of their motivations, it automatically works and increases their interest, interest level, right? Um, if it doesn't, if it, but it's a logical argument that, like, you should be able to make, um, then that is when the director asks for a role and says, like, okay, yep. and this is all happening behind the screen, right? The director is just ticking interest up and down. Um, when you make a role, you know, they set a TN, and the TN is based on the NPC's attitude. Um, that's all stuff that will probably be on, like, a GM screen in front of you, very easy to track. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, cool, they they chick they ticked up, or you failed the roll, oh, it ticks down, and then they say to you, okay, based on what you have, the argument you've made, what you want me to do, here's what I'm able to do for you. And then you can say, well, I need a little bit more, or you could say, hey, that's great, and the negotiation right there, right? So you can keep going back and forth, but every time you make an argument, the NPC's patience ticks down as well. So that means you can only make so many arguments before they say to you, okay, this is my final offer, this is it, Take it or leave it, right? And so there's a little bit of a push your luck of like, ooh, maybe we could get more, right? Like, yeah. I, I, I really, really want this this guy to throw in a magic item. Um, so I'm going to make the argument. But there's you run the risk of, oh, I could actually tick the interest down. And they say, you know what? Forget it. The, off the table now. That's what, This is what I'm going to offer you now. Um, they also have, uh, NPCs also have pitfalls which are like, hey, if you bring up this thing, and pitfalls are always related to the negotiation you're doing, if you bring up this thing, um, they are going to, uh, that is a an automatic failure, right? Like, it's, it's an anti-argument that appeals to a motivation, basically. So like, hey, if I bring up the fact that your estranged brother would have wanted you to do this, right? And you, the reason your brother is estranged is because you hate him and you don't want him brought up. Well, that means that yeah. this is gonna be bad for you, right? This negotiation is not gonna go the way you want. Yeah, I mean, there are die rolls associated with it, and there, it happens in rounds, and that's the, mm -hmm. the tick that causes your patience and interest to change. Uh, but primarily, it's about imagining these NPCs complexly. And mm -hmm. also giving players a reason to do things like research, right? Giving the players, that, like, hang on a minute, before we talk to this person, maybe we should go find out a little about them, right? And then that turns into its own little mini-adventure. That kind of Those kind of opportunities are, to me, an enormously fertile source for plots, tension, drama, adventures, um, yeah, because if you can find out a motivation, right, yeah. then you don't need to make or the check. Fall. You can just go yeah. in and say, yeah. 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 No, avoid a pitfall. So there's a bunch of really good questions here. Um, how does death and dying work? Well, you can you can die in this. Your character can die in this game. Mm -hmm. I think it's at your negative, your half your health. Is that? Or is it yep, negative? negative yeah. your bloodied value. Um, but when you're, neg when you're at negative health, you can still act. Um, you're not unconscious in our game. That's yeah. an important point. Something we haven't talked about, I don't think yet. Um, is that you can, what's the status? It's unstable. You're unstable, you can keep acting, but there's a price. Yeah. And I think we might implement like a, you can drop prone, you can play dead. Yes. Because people wanted, people we discovered in this design, that people wanted to be able to play dead. And we're like, oh shit, okay, so we'll probably have something in there that involves, you know, trying to trick people into, to, you know, so the earth elemental doesn't step on your head to make sure you're dead. <laughs> uh, but should you, should, so, but you can't, your character can die. It happens, happens to me all the fucking time. Um, so you can die. And if, if, but our goal is to make that interesting so that pretty soon in a game with only 10 levels, it might be as soon as second level. It could be, depending on the game you're running, it could be as soon as first level. But definitely I would imagine like by third level, uh, in our game, you, there will be ways for you to bring characters back from the dead. It's a fantasy game. It's a heroic fantasy game, 
right? And so there's a point where for, for you and for your hero, death becomes an, a, an obstacle that can be overcome. And what we want to do is we want to implement... So something we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. by the way, a big part of customizing your character in this game is titles, right? They're kind of our version of feats, right? But they require you to do a little something-something in order to get them. And we want to have a bunch of them in the core rulebook where you can see, oh, if I do this, that, and the other thing, I could join the Hawk Lords and I get a giant hawk? Yes. Now, that's extreme. That is an extreme example. That feats, I mean... Uh, Titles can be much more straightforward and kind of uh, simple and bite-sized. But we want to have titles that are post-mortem titles, where you can only get this title if you have died, right? The, the, uh, the implication being something happened to you while you were on the other side, right? And you come back with this new kind of um, awareness, this new ability. And I imagine right now, we haven't implemented this, I imagine that you're going to be marked somehow, Right, that's going to be obvious that you've been to the other side and you've come back. Now, whether or not it's so obvious that you can't hide it, well, that's going to depend on a case by case basis. But that's the idea of how um, death and dying are supposed to work. How indicative, says Tasty Newspaper, are the sample pages of the final design? I mean, not really at all yeah. indicative. We sort of threw them together very much at the last minute, um, but they do represent a direction that we want to go in. So I think the final. I think the final the final result might look really different, but we want it to look clean and have it, there's a certain aesthetic that we're going for that we like, and that we think like a lot of other games like our our art director is, has a lot of a lot of opinions about the way books are laid out in, in this business, and so I expect to see something like what you saw but better, mm -hmm. because literally we just threw it together in the last couple of weeks. Um, can you get subclasses at level one, James? Uh, I it may depend on your class, right? Like oh, I do goodness. imagine that it may be that somebody like the conduit, their subclass may be based on the god that they worship, and that's probably a decision that makes sense that you would pick it at level one. Um, but uh, I think if we can avoid you having to make too many decisions at first level, right? There's already a lot of decisions you have to make to build a character. I'd like to be able to make that a level two choice, um, so that you get to play the game with your character and stuff. So we'll see. Uh, it may depend on the class, though. Isaac Everett, thank you for the 10 bucks. For those of us who love low magic settings, I can already <laughs> see this is going to be a no. Let's find out where <laughs> the sentence goes. Will it be possible to play an all martial, i.e. Oh. no magic party? Um, uh, that yeah. seems unlikely to me. I mean, you're I, I, a part, like, it depends. Do you think the operator is magical? Like, is the operator going to be core? I don't know. Like, do you think yeah. the beast heart is magical? I mean, I think the beast heart is like supernatural. Yeah, yeah. Right? They have, like, like, the beast heart yeah. has a supernatural relationship with that, with its pet. But it doesn't cast spells. Like, like it, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know your own personal idiosyncratic definition of magic, right? Well, we saw people online who's like, oh, I don't like the new, I don't like the new MCDM game. This is literally a quote, mm -hmm. because every character can cast spells. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I actually was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, they all have that heroic resource. That's magic. And I was like, got it. The heroic resource is magic. <laughs> you're right. You would not like this game. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm like, you're right. You would not like this game. So the difference, once you want, every class is going to have a heroic resource. So if that's the thing that makes, you're, I'm not saying you are, I read your message, uh, that makes you go, oh, never mind. I want to play less interesting and less fun characters. There are tons of other games out there. Right. Um, but if you accept the, if you accept the heroic resource as just being an action movie thing and not explicitly a magic thing, then I feel like you might be able to get about, you know, three fifths of the way there. We'll yeah. see. It depends on how many, depends on which classes are in the core book. Yeah, and I would say, like, you know, there are things that, like, the Fury, I don't think of as a magical class. I don't no, think most neither. people would. No. But they can, even at first level, jump a pretty ridiculous yeah. amount, right? Yeah. Because it's a heroic game. Yeah, they can, they can jump Jason Bourne distances. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And real people in the real world can't do that <laughs> stuff. But... So yeah, I think I think the, the the real question and the reason I, the reason I was able Isaac to be able to tell the answer um, is because you said for those of us who love low magic settings, this is not a low magic game, mm -hmm. right? Um, that we would love to make that game. By the way, uh, we would love to make a kind of a game that you could play the actual Black Company in, right? Black Company very low magic, right? It's all daggers and swords and stealth and skullduggery, and there's like two wizards and they and most of what they do is illusion stuff. Um, but yeah, so that would that sounds great. There are games out there. I think Shadow Dark is relatively low magic. Um, you can go play that. There's tons of games like that. But no, our game is the the the. the, the it, I don't think of it as high. Like I don't think of Basiloria mm -hmm. as high fantasy. To me, the thing that determines whether a setting is high fantasy or low fantasy is how much access does a normal citizen have to magic. 
right? So the fact that there's 20th level wizards in your D&D game, that does not automatically to me mean that it must therefore be high magic. If there's only five of them on the entire planet, right? And the average peasant lives their life with maybe a local priest who can maybe cure light wounds, that kind of thing. That to me, that's a low magic setting, right? But for our, for, you know, so I think of Vaslori as being relatively low magic, right? But our characters are heroes. They can do extraordinary mm -hmm. things. And they start, they start as heroes. They don't start as like a peasant that just put down their sword. Uh, so if, if what you like is that low magic, gritty, um, you know, tracking torches, worrying about light kind of thing, this game's not that. It's not that, man. Um, so there are some good questions about... Uh, there, I saw some people wanted to know how much uh, lore yeah, is going to, to be in the book. I actually not. Yeah. I would say it depends. Like not more than you saw in Flea Mortals. Yeah. Not more than you saw in the Talent. It's not the, the core books aren't setting books. Right. That's what the Vasloria box set's going to be. But there is a setting in there. So it, it, I, I I should say not more than Flea Mortals implies. Right. Like if you read Flea Mortals and you wondered what would the player's handbook of this be, well that's going to have more lore in it because you saw the dwarf you saw the dwarf um, right up in the preview stuff that much yeah. lore. That's like the, you know, it's, I, I think if you think dwarves are cool, you would read that right up and go, I like these dwarves, right? Um, and, but they're ours. They're uniquely ours. They, they look different than normal dwarves. They have a different uh, biology than normal dwarves, normal, normal fantasy dwarves, and they can do cooler and, more, and different things. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's going to be, you know, medium to low amounts of lore. There's also a good question from uh, Sydney Sorrentino. Thank you for the 20 bucks. Uh, Please uh, tell me you are going to show pets, companions, and mount some love. Well, good news. Uh, if you've read the Beast Heart, yeah. um, that is definitely going to be a class that shows up in this game. Uh, there's a question about what will be core and what won't be. Will we have companions? Will we not? Um, but we will eventually have companions in this game, just like we do in the Beast Heart. Uh, yeah. And you will be able to have pets. Uh, companions also make great mounts. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. I have a, a soft spot for the Beast Heart because I was the lead designer on it. It's the first D&D class I ever made and published oh, um, really? so yeah yeah, yeah. That's cool. so I'm, I'm excited to to bring it to this game uh yeah i mean uh, the beast heart's brilliant yeah I, I was one of those things where i pitched i pitched the beast heart to james and i thought i thought i was saying now go find someone to make this because james among other <laughs> things manages our freelancers and he's like no i'm doing this and i was like oh okay cool <laughs> i was like this is gonna be awesome somebody asked about um the dwarf write up very mm -hmm. that person's very close to my heart because I worked really hard on that stupid thing. It's great. Um, and so they're good. like, is that is that your favorite ancestry in the game so far? Um, it's the only one that has a write-up <laughs> like that right now. Like, um, you know, I actually did a write-up for the humans that you might see maybe next week or the week after. We'll see. Um, so you're going to get to see some, another, at least one more preview page spread, I think. It's, tr it's, it's tough because there's a whole bunch of stuff we wanted to do once the crowdfunder was live. Mm -hmm. But we worked so hard to get it done that now everyone's wiped out and exhausted and so I don't know when you'll get to see it but I wrote up um, some text for the human entry and we're getting some art done so you might see that but I'm actually really looking forward to all the stuff left to write like having written the dwarf thing I was I, when I woke up yesterday uh, yeah I wanted to know if we funded or not but I wanted to know <laughs> I was like did anybody read the dwarf write up <laughs> right because I was like this is this is really cool and this is the direction we want to take dwarves in and it's very much adjacent to classic dwarves but it's also its own it's kind of its own thing and so now I'm looking forward to writing the elf write-ups I'm looking forward to writing up we have new we have new ancestries we, you might get to see a revenant spread we have revenant art mm -hmm. that we finished but we can't, haven't gotten a chance to show you because we don't have a, a layout for it yet um, the Memonek, the Protean, stuff like that. I mean, I still, I still want to put the Omnivoc as an ancestry in the core book. But unlike, it would say, you know, dwarves, high elves, woad elves, the Omnivoc, you know, <laughs> that, 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 because I think, I, I think there's only one. <laughs> I think there's only one of this thing left, left in the world, right? It's kind of like a replicant. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, artificial person made by the Steel Dwarves, and they're referenced in Flea Mortals. But I think it'd be super cool if it's like, no, 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 you, you can do whatever you want in your own game. But canonically, there is literally only one of these things uh, out there in the world. And if you want to play that one, here are the stats for it. So I'm really like, um, hey James, how is how is Matt as a boss? Oh, great. Um, la, 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 la. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There's no way James could fairly answer that question. I'm sitting right next to him. Yeah. Right. Um, so <laughs> horrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm I'm sure it's like anything else. You've got to take the good with the bad. I don't know about that. No. Uh, <laughs> there might be a link for people to go check out. 
Oh, oh yeah. Yes. So somebody asked. I actually I saw this message and I forgot about it. But somebody asked, "Is there any chance that will there will be another wave of a limited edition Ajax boxes?" There is. Yeah. Right think, now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It literally, it literally did not occur to us. This is not a. We're, those people who've been in the community for a long time know this. We don't. We're not trying to game the system. We're not trying to artificially gin up demand for anything. The demands either. In fact, we mm -hmm. hate that. We want the opposite. We want. We want to know that the people backing it really want it. Right. That's why we're talking about what the game is and what it's not. We don't want people jumping in for reasons other than they mm -hmm. want the game. So it never occurred to us. It really did not occur to us that the Ajax edition would sell out in like I don't know what it was like eight minutes. <laughs> it was some crazy short period of time where all of a sudden the Ajax edition was gone. And so as soon as we all were conscious again yesterday, we all, and keep in mind that mm -hmm. um, I was getting text messages from my in real life friends, some of whom you know, who are like, I woke up this morning, it was already gone. I'm like, ah, <laughs> right? So all of us know people who are like, hey, hey, what the, where's the, we're like, okay, well, should we do more of these? Does it make sense to do more of these? And here's, here's the thing, right? Every one, of, <laughs> every one of those we sell, as far as I know, as, at least into North America, I believe it's, if it's in Europe, it's different. But every one of those we sell into North America, Jerry and Jeff have to physically put together yes. themselves. <laughs> right? So they literally had to figure out how long does it take to put one together, how many of these are we doing, how many weeks is it going to take to do this? <laughs> and so getting them to sign off on, yeah, we can do more, mm -hmm. meant their actual literal physical labor making this happen. And so I think they put another thousand units into into the mix. So hopefully, hopefully those don't sell out in eight minutes. Because if so, I then eight hundred another eight hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah. Another eight hundred and fifty yeah, yeah, yeah. into the channel. And if those sell out in eight minutes, then that will mean that I I was right and and Jeff was wrong. <laughs> uh, um, James Warner says the do the dwarf thing was dope. Thank you very much, James Warner. I know you're a fan of Vasoria. Um, yeah. Do we intend to make versions of our supplemental books? We've got this question a lot, and I yeah. didn't really address it. Drak and Rowell, thank you for the super chat. Are we going to make supplements? Are we going to take Strongholds, Followers, Kingdoms, Warfare, Where Evil Lives for this game? Um, uh, I think if the game grows and does well, I think all of those rules you will see instantiated somewhere in here. The example is the Vasloria box set. The Vasloria box set is almost certainly going to include rules for warfare. Yep. Right? And they might be a little better than the ones in Kingdoms and Warfare because they're specific to the setting. And I think that's kind of our philosophy in general is like, you know, we want to, we, we, we show you all the, our world mm -hmm. and our proper nouns on purpose so that it's easier for you to file the serial number off and be like, no, no, I don't have, I don't have Lord Saxton in my game, but I've got this person, right? Um, so instantiating Warfare specifically to Vasloria, I think is going to make that system better. I'm already really proud of that system. And I like the only way I would revise Kingdoms and Warfare right now is decouple intrigue from warfare because I thought we needed to do that in order to make them relevant to fighting monsters. But it turned out people were like, no, 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 I'm perfectly capable of making intrigue and warfare dramatic for their their for their own reason and have nothing to do with fighting monsters. We're like, oh, word, mm -hmm. okay, well, all right. So you'll probably see intrigue reinstantiated in the capital box set. Should we get to make one of those? It's not a stretch goal. Um, but I mean, we'll, it depends on whether or not the audience grows. So strongholds, I, that's a good question. We definitely had like Sadie Lowry helmed the Ilrigger revised, mm -hmm. and she, before she had done that, she had taken a stab at like I I I, I did some work saying here's how I think. I would revise strongholds uh, and followers. I would do it like this, right? They should be more modular. It should be more about a group thing, not individual strongholds. It should still support individual strongholds. Mm -hmm. And so we gave that to Sadie, and she was like, yep, this is super cool. And she actually prototyped it out, and we paid her for it. So we have a prototype sitting around here somewhere of the a revision to strongholds and followers, just the design. <clears throat> yeah. I, so I don't know. I don't think that's core. Like, But I don't know. Is yeah. it going to be in a Vasloria box set? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, that's kind of the future. So it kind of, on a case by case basis, it kind of depends on how relevant is that design to what we're doing. Um, something like where evil lives would be great, right? Because that's such a useful product, but actually just doing where evil lives again. I don't know about that. You yeah. Know, maybe we would do kind of where evil lives too. Yeah, right? yeah. And that, but it would be, it would be where evil lives one for our game, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, and right, like where evil lives maps were made they were battle maps made for D D, which has a different way of interacting with the environment than our game does right and so like there would be things that we'd need to change about maps and update so we might as well make tailor it to our game i would you know like intrigue you'd yep. probably see in capital right yeah, that's all yeah. yep. yep yep if there's a capital if the vasloria box does well and people mm -hmm. 
use it and that and those people bring other people in and they grow then we'll probably do a capital box set um if it does this you know people buy it and then they don't do anything with it well then uh sable phoenix says i just want to say love the twists mcdm puts on classic fantasy creatures as well as the bizarre cool scary original monsters that makes us really happy that's why you know that's one of the things we go to nick for nick makes dope ass numa all the demons and all that stuff is a lot of those things are nick despain originals and they're really cool um, so thank you, thank you for the kind words. That makes me happy. Matt, will we see interdimensional toad beasts? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know question. that we have. I don't know that we have. Like to me, I, we don't, we don't steal things just because we like. Them. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. We, we we steal things because we think well, a because they're old typically, um, and because it, they inspire us. And then it's the thing that inspires us that drives us forward, not the thing we're stealing from. Right, mm -hmm. and so I don't know what our ver. I'm, I'm sure we'll have something like that. Like we have a whole timescape to populate, and we're going to need lots of bad guys. I just don't. I just suspect they won't be. They'll be our version of that. They'll be completely different. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Ian V says you touched on uh, any, any uh, as a huge fan of the necromancer with a big sword. Is that a fantasy you'll think you'll support? Well, we don't mm -hmm. know. But James really likes the idea that the summoner, apart from summoning minions, can also summon like weapons and armor. Oh, yeah. Right now, these might only live for an encounter or whatever. Um, but but that that should absolutely be possible. It won't it won't be unique to the necromancer, right? Maybe necromancer with a big sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it might be that you summon bone armor and a sword made out of a you know giant spinal column, right? Um, that sounds dope. We should do that. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Rapine says, "How does the two d six work in defense? You do not defend on two d six." Mm-hmm. You, the defender, the defender takes damage. The attacker does damage. Yeah, heroes have triggered actions. So if you are a a, a, a stealthy character, right, or a, an agile character, you might have a triggered action that lets you get out of trouble. Like the shadow can teleport away, um, and the tactician can parry an incoming blow. Right, the talent can throw up a telekinetic shield. Those are ways that you can reduce damage. But you, as a hero, have to act actively use those things in yeah. order to be able to avoid damage. Yeah, there are lots of ways. Like, one way to avoid damage is to be tactically good at playing the game mm -hmm. and, like, not, not being where the people are. That, and that is a real thing. Like, different, different classes have different tools of dealing with this stuff. One way to avoid damage is to not care about damage because you have a stupid amount of health, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, I don't care. I don't care if I get hit. <laughs> so there are lots of ways in this game for people to avoid damage. Some of them are active. Some of them are passive. Some of them are more about positioning. But that's how we think it should be. It should be I avoided damage because I played my character well, not just because I rolled well. Uh, by the way, I just want to tell everybody, I, I am seeing a ton of really good questions in here. Yeah. Um, including some, some stuff that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, where I'm like, oh, that's a good question. How, how does that work? <laughs> so I feel I, I feel really good about that. Even though we're not going to get to all these questions in this chat, we will get to them all eventually because we got to figure this stuff out at, at sooner or later. So by all means, come by James's. Uh, James has his own Twitch that he streams oh, yeah. once a week, and he basically t mostly talks about this game. Um, come by our Discord. You'll you'll we'll we'll have answers to all these questions sooner or later. Um, yeah, there's. A, I see a lot of questions that have been about. Will we have a system for crafting magic items? Oh, yeah, 100. Yeah, and yeah, big, we will. That's a real. In fact, yeah. In fact, uh, one of the things I have to do once we go back to work is I have to write up how do languages work in our game. I don't think that's going to be a lot of work, by the way. It's probably going to be like a page of text, right? How do languages work in our game? And the idea of having different levels of fluency, probably four. One of which is I'm not fluent, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So three levels of being able to speak it. You know, idiomatic, that kind of thing. And we need that because one of the things we want to do with the research and crafting system is we want the language of the thing you're researching. So finding ancient tomes in dead languages suddenly can be a big deal because it's like, well, I, I actually speak a language related to that. So my fluency level affects how easy it is for me to extract the knowledge from this tome. We don't like the, in fact, we talked about this yesterday, is making sure that our game does not have these crazy narrative breaking get out of jail free cards where you're trying to create some drama over something but there's a spell that just goes and just oh i just do it oh okay great and so like comprehend languages where you can just at first level you can just go and all of a sudden i know i know any language i need to know perfectly fluent that removes a lot of drama from the game and removes a lot of cool gameplay opportunities and there's a ton of things like that in d20 fantasy so i do think at higher levels you will have abilities that can magically affect your fluency but it's not like night and day suddenly i can speak every language mm -hmm. right so i got to design design it's really just i mean you just heard it that's that's it just turning what I just said into text. I have to design the language rules, right? How does language work in this game? And then we can go and start prototyping some of the other stuff in this game, like research and crafting. Um, yeah. That's a we, we, we really want people to be able to have ambition. We want your character to have 
to have cool things that stimulate your ambition. Like, oh, you, I could, I could build one of those things. Yep, it's three thousand <laughs> research points, which is going to take you uh, probably about three years to do, <laughs> right? But now you can get started. You can make progress during downtime and stuff like that. And having those things where, like, at first level, you fell in love with this, but you and you weren't even able to make one until fifth level, right? You're like, damn. But that also, if we can do that, that also means stuff like healing potions, or, you know, consumable items can be things that are easy to make. Mm -hmm. um, so we already have, uh, we already have pretty good designs or uh, ideas for that that I think will make good design. Does the game asks Lord Tuba does the game assume the party will always be the same level that's a good question that's it uh, so uh, right now the party is always the same level <laughs> Yeah. So because there's only one level right now. Yeah, there's only one level right now. Um, as we develop other levels of the game, we may get into testing that. But I think the game is going to assume, for the most part, that you are the same level or within one level of each other. Probably, we need to talk about rewards and advancement. Matt and I have ideas of how that works. I think the question that I would have is, if you miss a session, yep. do you get the XP or not? Right, and and that's the thing we need to talk about. I mean, I think but, that like yeah. I, I liked, I, I felt mm. like having having done my time in the third edition trenches, where those of you who don't know how this works, by the way, strap in. <laughs> um, so in third edition, and keep in mind when this game came out, this made total sense to us. We we're like, yes, that's how it should work. Um, you got XP based on how much tougher the monster was than you, not how tough the monster was. That was AD&D, right? Mm -hmm. So you would say, this monster is really tough. It has a lot of XP. But in third edition, it was relative. Right? So if you had, which we often did, if you had characters of multiple different levels, we fight an ogre. That ogre is worth less XP to the third level character than it is to the first level character because an ogre is way tougher than a first level character. But then you're in a, in a matrix with five players at the table. All of, we're all fighting this one monster and then you have multiple encounters, encounters that have multiple monsters of different levels in it and you have to calculate the value of those monsters on a per player basis. I think we probably spent about 45 minutes every session when we were done <laughs> just calculating XP. Right, and then all of a sudden, fourth edition comes along, and it's like everybody's the same level, man. When you, you all level up together, at, 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 we were like, oh, "Oh my god, I cannot tell you how many hours my friends and I spent arguing, arguing very passionately because it was so important to us about the idea that, like, well, Dave wasn't here last week. Why did he get XP? Mm -hmm. He didn't risk his he didn't risk his character's life, right? Because we were very steeped in that 1970s ethos, which keep in mind I love and I could easily go back to probably with probably with another like OSR mm -hmm. style game, something like Shadow Dark mm -hmm. or Forbidden Lands. We talked about that. You know that notion of you weren't here for this. Why did they get XP? They didn't risk their because back then. Every session you were risking, like just opening doors, you were risking your death happened all the time. Characters died all the time back then in quite undramatic and unfun ways. And that, you know, so, so we hated that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I like that idea that like, everybody's the same level, man. Like when, you, when, when one character levels up, they all level up. Now we'll probably have advice for, so you don't want to do it that way, right? Um, and then that's just how I feel right now. You know, James and I will talk about it. And we'll poll the electorate. We'll see how other people feel. We'll implement something, listen to them, see if it's satisfying what the community needs or wants. That's the thing is just because I think something, that doesn't mean that's how it's going to be. There's going to be tons of iteration and feedback. Uh, James, do you want to go? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, so I have seen a question about will we have Dragonborn? Uh, I mean, that's that's a thing that we have talked about having a dragon folk type uh, uh, yeah. ancestry. The biggest challenge right now is what do we call it? Yep. Draconian is the term we're using uh, just as a kind of st stubbed in placeholder. That might be the real name. Um, I thought I spent a little, I spent a couple cycles trying to think of what people in Vasloria would call. Well, what they call them is they call them Good King Omen's Dragon Phalanx because they've never met Dragonborn that aren't a member of this um, of this unit because they were magically created by uh, uh, Good King Omen's wizard uh, uh, Vitae. Uh, so the uh, but if they were a native ancestry that were just hanging out in this in this region of Orden, what would those people call it? And they would, would call them um, Worm Whites. W Y R M W I G A I G H T, worm white is cool. a, literally would just be like Anglo-Saxon for dragon person, um, and so I think probably they'll get two names, right? They'll be the name that we call them, and and that most people, most adventurers call them, and then they'll be worm white is what like traditional people from this part of the world call it. Um, yeah, 
Uh, Ace Wheelie wants to know, uh, can we explain the difference between, or can we explain not the difference, just explain how they work, victories and recoveries? Yeah, that's very simple. So recoveries are a healing resource that you use to heal yourself. Um, you start the day with a certain number, generally based on your class and your endurance score. Um, and you might get more as you level up. And when you spend recovery, you recover about a third of your health. Um, those go down and you get them back by resting, right? Um, so that is your impetus to rest. Victories are your impetus to not rest. Um, so as you adventure, each time you, um, you know, successfully defeat an enemy in combat, like a combat encounter, or when you do something else, like have a great negotiation or do a complex trap, right? Like avoid a complex trap, um, you get a victory. And you have powers that increase based on the number of victories you have that make you more effective in combat. You also get more resources to power your uh, stuff based on the number of victories you have. And so your victories drop to zero when you rest. They actually convert into XP. Um, so there's this tension you have of like, oh, can we keep going? Should we push it? Should we keep going? I don't know. I only have one or two recoveries left. Well, yeah, but we're going to start this battle with all of on these resources, victory, yeah, right? Yeah. So like, we should do it. We should push ourselves. I saw that happen in a game with Matt and Lars, right. and it made me really happy because I was like, oh, oh, it's it might be working. Yeah, it might was, actually be working. Yeah, I, I talk about that in the video. That was the first that was the first prototype. Mm -hmm. And all we've done is refine it since then. There's really good questions in here. I'm so happy there we're doing are. this. Um, somebody says, has the idea, this is uh, Bernardo Bonilla, uh, has the idea of a party mm -hmm. sheet been floated around for the RPG similar to the one in Kingdoms of Warfare? No, not no, yet. No, not yet. Not yet. I really like that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like the idea of I, we're, we're, I'm not just making my character. We are going to collectively decide what kind of party we are. Um, I think that stuff is really cool. I don't know that it's core to this game. You right. know, like I said, it's the tyranny of the page count. And p keep in mind, by the way, I'm not sure I was clear on this. When I talked about the tyranny of the page count, like we're funding 800 pages of rules, right? Uh, 400 of those pages are monsters. <laughs> so that means we only got 400 pages of like what we think of as Actual rules, right? Um, monsters and how to build encounters, how to balance encounters, that kind of thing. So the rest of it is, so th it, that 400 pages is going to spend fast. Yes. So the idea of having party sheets in there, probably not. Maybe a supplement, maybe in um, maybe a supplement specific to uh, setting, maybe something in a future issue of Arcadia, if indeed we get to do future issues of Arcadia, which I feel like, given the interest in this game, mm -hmm. seems likely, um, but not guaranteed. Uh, how easy or hard do we believe it'll be to homebrew stuff for the system? Uh, I, I think pretty easy, and we want to make it easy, right? Like, we're the we're the place that comes from, um, you know, running the game. Uh, and we want to make it easy for you to run the game and build the stuff you want. So, like, uh, we would like to make it as easy as possible for you to create monsters, classes, and magic items, things like that. So here's a no bullshit, like, how we, how we translate what James just said into actual action. This is mm -hmm. literal game development from a meeting we had yesterday where we were talking about how many, as now we're working on progression, right? We've yeah. figured out how first level works. We figured out how fighting monsters work. We figured out how negotiation works. There's a lot of work still to be done on all these things, but we feel good about all this. It's time to start figuring out how does level two work? How does level three work? How does customizing your character work? So we had a discussion about how many, when I choose this, this tactician subclass and I hit third level, so I'm a, um, I'm a knight commander tactician and I hit third level, how many choices am I making and what are those choices? Well, obviously it would be cool if there were a couple of unique third level knight commander tactician powers to choose from. But then I said, hang on a minute. I think the choice is I chose the knight commander subclass, right? So when I get to third level, I just get this ability. Now I'm gonna say this live to James. Actually, something I was thinking about was the idea that there might be like every level, there's a new tactician ability right, and right. a new ability from your subclass and you pick between those. Right, right, right. right. So you're always choosing one of two, mm -hmm. but you're not choosing from three different knight <laughs> commander abilities or three different three different uh, archer tactician abilities or three different bulwark champion abilities that's nine different abilities we'd have to cook up just for third level mm -hmm. right and at that point it starts to get um, I, and then I, I flash back to an earlier edition of the game where making custom classes for that game was it was so hard no one did it 
mm -hmm. right? Because there were so many, there were 20 levels for one thing. We don't have that problem. Actually, 30, technically. 30. There were yes. 30 levels in that edition of D&D. And you were always, you always had multiple choices for everything you were doing. And I'm like, hang on, that's why people didn't make homebrew content for this. It's because there's just too goddamn many choices, right? So it's all, it's a question about where are you making your choice, right? So we mm -hmm. want you to be able to highly customize your class, but that's going to come from things like your ancestry, your upbringing, your past, your your or career, right? And then your class, and then your subclass. And we might have prestige classes. We really like those. So mm -hmm. at that point, you got to say, stop, hang on a second. We can't then have even more choices on top of that, even though people like more choices, because what we'd be doing is making it hard for people to homebrew, and we want to make it easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so saying 10 levels, and you're choosing between a couple, of, only a couple of different things each level, that that constrains it to being solvable. People will be able to make custom classes for this, we hope. How GM friendly is this going to be? Nick Howard asks. I mean, pretty random tables, session prep tools, reference guides. I mean, it depends. We want to, we want to publish adventures and stuff like that. It depends on what kind of resources you uniquely might need in order to make a game. I think it's going to be pretty, I mean, look at Flea Mortals, right? Flea Mortals makes it really fun and relatively easy to make cool, dynamic encounters for your players because every type of monster well you know like orcs there's like eight different kinds of orc just in that one book right and then there's you know nine different types of kobold so mm -hmm. you 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 could you could potentially never run out of just orc encounters every one would be a different oh, i'll use two shamans this time right i'll have no snipers this time right and that is fun it is fun to build encounters like that so i know that like you know random charts and stuff like that i think are good for stimulating stimulating inspiration Right, where you're like, oh, I don't know what my adventure is going to be about. Ooh, that kind of thing is cool. But we think giving you tools that are a little bit more actionable to make custom content is better. We'll see. I think it's going to be, I mean, Green. if it's not, if it, it should be as, it's going to be as director friendly as we can make it because we're directors, right? We're, <laughs> we're, my, I ran a whole, I did a whole, whole series of videos about how to run RPGs and we want it to be easy, easy and fun. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of questions about magic, about uh, like, is there lore for magic and how will magic work? So I, uh, I can answer how magic works, um, yeah. sort of. Cool. Uh, in, in mechanically, I can't wait to find out. <laughs> mechanically, I can say we've tried a couple of different things um, and we are continuing to uh, to throw stuff at the wall and, and some of it is like, uh, I would say initially we were trying to figure out like, well, magic should work this way. We were starting with the mechanics instead of starting with the fantasy. Um, and now we are like, okay, but actually, what is the fantasy? What's of, the archetype? Yeah, yeah. What's the, yeah, and unfortunately, we're we're inheriting a lot of uh, cultural nonsense from a earlier uh, from a game from the 1970s that didn't really think in these terms. And so, if you look at the D20 Wizard, it doesn't really have an archetype, right? It's, no. it's several it's several archetypes kind of jammed into this one kind of very junky somewhat, in my opinion, broken design. And so for us, it's going to be more about breaking that stuff out so that if we have, a, which I don't, I don't know if we will, I don't think we will, but we might. If we have like an illusionist class, mm -hmm. um, they're going to have their own resources and they're going to work their own way and we're going to focus on that design rather than trying to come up with a generalized spellcaster and then cram a bunch of half-assed archetypes in there, none of which it delivers on well. So that's the principle behind the necromancer. So right now, I, one of the things I started prototyping was the elementalist, which we think is might be the closest thing we have to your generic mage. And that currently relies on uh, multi-turn casting, which I'm not going to say much about until it goes through more testing. We have already tested multi-turn casting. It seemed to work okay. I was, I was astonished. It was my mm -hmm. design, and I was astonished that it didn't fall apart immediately, <laughs> right? Um, I, was, I, was, I thought it was going to fall apart, like, literally in three or four rounds of our first test of it. But it worked really well. Yeah. There may be some edge case nonsense that we have to iron out. But imagine casting Fireball, and the longer you cast it, the more damage it does. Or the more you, the longer you spend casting it, the bigger an area it affects. There's a lot of opportunity. But you could just be like, nope, I just want to do it right now. Boom. Right? So that kind of like another one of those kind of push your luck mechanics. Do I want to keep casting this, or do I want to let it go right now? That's something we still kind of believe in. It's just one way we might instantiate this. We'll see. But that's something I got to go work on. I was, I was actually, I had the bit between the teeth a couple of weeks ago. I had to put it down because I had a lot of work to do for this crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, how are we accounting for varying skill levels of players? Like, are we gonna have to handicap people? That'd be, that'd be, that'd be interesting. Um, it, it, uh, 
Yeah. I, so Are there more complex mechanics for more experienced players? That's a good question. Yeah. It's going to be on an archetype by archetype basis. Like, for instance, what I just described with the Elementalist, that might be a little noodlier than some people want, but we'll have other options. We already have the talent, which is, um, you know, very much direct brain, brain make thing explode class. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then there's stuff like the Fury, which, man... You don't even have to worry. You don't even have to spend. If you don't want to spend, if you're like, heroic resources are dumb, fine. Don't spend your heroic resource. You just build up fury and you're doing cooler and cooler shit just from that. Just from that, like, I've got I've got X fury and now I have damage reduction. I have X plus three fury and now I get bonus movement. Eventually I can I can keep fighting with no problem even when, you know, I'm, I'm unstable. It's, uh, so there are different classes have different levels of complexity. But there isn't a, cl there isn't a class that is designed on, there isn't a, so you want a simple class you want something simple class. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that some archetypes r result in more direct design and simpler design. So like the, we didn't design the Fury to be simple and easy to play, but it, it is compared to the other classes just because of the fantasy of that archetype, if that makes sense. So the fantasy comes first, and then we just hope that we have a lot of room in the book to put a lot of classes in. Um, you. Oh, great. Um, so there is a question from Delhi. It uh, says, as an avid druid player, are we going to include a class in the book, uh, that core class in a book or in a later supplement? I'll play regardless. And uh, how are you at finding the balance between martial and magic classes to make feel both feel just as cinematic? Well, I think, um, you know, in terms of a druid, uh, I think we would need a really good idea. We've talked about it in the past, which may be why it's coming up. Now, but it may be that again, the druid might not be the specific fantasy. We might have like a shape shifting class, yeah. who really does the shape shifting thing, right? Yeah. That that a druid does, and then there might be like a nature magicy witch class, right, yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, we actually talked about having a witch class. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it made it on the short list. We had a lot of ideas for classes. Yeah, we had a, um, and we also had, um, but but that might uh, now we think that might be a kit. Yes. Right. Uh, the the witch might be one of the caster kits. We'll see. Yeah, we, we actually spent some cycles trying to figure out, you know, is the shapeshifter fantasy robust enough mm -hmm. to support a class that only shapeshifts? And we started to think probably not. You probably need some a little magic stuff thrown in, you know, mm -hmm. like just being able to turn into a bear. Like, you know, like, let's imagine I could turn into a bear right now. That'd be pretty cool, but it wouldn't mean I could fight Thanos. <laughs> I would just be a bear, right? I would just be a bear, and that ability would be neat, but you want to actually, like, you don't just, you don't just want to shapeshift into a bear. You want to do crazy over-the-top stuff, over stuff that a fantasy bear would do. Right, and at that point, you start needing some magic thrown in. And at mm -hmm. that point, are you a, maybe now you're a regular druid? You're casting spells, and um, but I actually think that like um, uh, that the shapeshifter class might be the like the beast heart who plays the I, I am I, I use ferocity. Yeah, right? yeah. Like I, I I I don't need magic. I don't need magic. I I build ferocity, and I that's what that's what powers my dope ass. I think we might have just designed yeah. the shapeshifter class. Yeah, you you're the use, Hulk, right? Yeah, you're basically the Hulk. <laughs> yeah, you 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 Hulk out, and now you have uh you have you every time somebody attacks you, you build more ferocity, and you spend it on cool powers, your bear powers if you turn into a bear, your squid powers if you turn into a squid, um, and we've already got that design. We've already got that um, tons of coming up with tons of cool ways to have a basilisk pet, to have a manticore pet, to have a cobalt pet. Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are sentient creatures. Um, you know, so that that design is already implemented in the Beast Heart. Then the only question is coming up with a design for playing the pet, right? I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn into this thing. Um, so we'll see. I mean, having a, a, a nature magic class, which is the other half of the druid. Druids ha druids were the nature priests before they were shapeshifters in uh, D20 Fantasy. So the question is: Is there a class that is the nature priest, or do we just have nature domains for right. the, for the conduit? Yeah. You know? Do we need with the conduit virtue and wrath? Do we need a druid class? So it all depends. Like a lot of these archetypes evolved over the decades until and some of them are unique to fifth edition or unique mm -hmm. to D and D. And it's like, well, we don't. That's not the way we think. We we want to we want to do cool new stuff. We want to build this stuff from the ground. We start from first principles. We don't. We don't start from. So we need a shape shifting magic druid spellcaster. No, we don't. We don't think that way. Um, but the shape shifter archetype is really, really cool fantasy, popular fantasy. Do we think crowd control is going to be uh, a full role in a game where every character? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's yeah. kind of the tactician archer that I was talking about would be more of a controller. Yeah. Right. Because they can attack multiple people, doing a little bit of damage to each of them, but screwing with them in interesting ways. Um, yeah. Ahead. 
there's a, a, a how are we finding the, how do we balance martial and magic and make that like cool and cinematic? The answer is you know we think about what are some really cool things that martial heroes can do, right? Matt yeah. gave you that example of the archer. Um, we think about that, like what does Captain America do that's cool, right? He's yeah. not a magic person. Yeah. What does Jason Bourne do, right? Yeah. Like yeah. we we're constantly talking about like oh okay yeah and that that like you know. Cap is just as cool as Doctor Strange yeah. gets as many cinematic moments, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's it's that we, we that's what the heroic resource is for. It lets you do heroic over the top stuff, like the Fury leaping twenty feet in mm -hmm. one jump, in a standing jump, right? It's epic. You can't do it every round. You got to pay for it, right? But you can do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, every time I put a Flea Mortals encounter, uh, both my players and I have the best time. Can't wait to experience a whole system like that. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Will Arcadia become the home uh, for some playstyle modifications uh, that are outside of the like the core heroic tactical fantasy? Um, if we do bring back something like Arcadia, um, you will probably see then their ideas that authors may have. Now, oh, got a little mouse man, that is awesome. Yeah, I got that. They threw that in. I spent a lot of money getting oh minis gosh. painted, and they're like, we got one of these. you want it? And they just tossed a little it mouse man. Yeah, a little yeah. mouse man mini. Anyway, sorry. Um, so if we do something like Arcadia, that will be where we would probably try our weirdest and most experimental ideas. Um, but I also think that if we wanted to do dungeon survival, we would probably just make a game for that. We wouldn't, That's the idea. you know, create an, create an add-on for that. I think the idea is that we want to make games that do things well, that are not a generalist, like, this. you can do everything here, right? This is specifically for heroic fantasy, which is pretty broad. Yeah, it's pretty, it's broad. pretty broad. Yeah, uh, if it's a it's a big tent. It's a big tent, but it's it's not as big as so like dungeon survival. We have ideas for that. Matt and I love that oh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I've got you know, there's lots of there's lots of design. There's there's crazy ideas. I have crazy ideas for RPG resolution mechanics that I never even pitched when we were working on this because sure. they weren't appropriate to what we were trying to do. We don't want to try to we don't want to try to force a round peg into a square hole. Speaking of which, Lord God, great name, says um, <laughs> you describe the game as not a typical dungeon crawler, not not typical dungeon crawling and exploration. I want to stop you there. It's not. It's not. It, it, it's this game is not not your typical dungeon crawler. It's not not your typical exploration <laughs> RPG. It's just not those things, right? <laughs> right? It's not those things. It's not like we have this crazy new spin on Dungeon, uh-uh, no. Yeah. So when you ask like, what does a typical session look like? Go watch the Chain of Acheron, go watch Dusk. Mm -hmm. You do that stuff, right? Um, how do players discover magic items? They they kill bad guys and loot, and loot uh, tombs, right? How do they accumulate wealth? Well, we have our own idea for a wealth mechanic because we don't think, in the Chain of Acheron, it's not about how many gold pieces have they, did they pick this guy's pocket mm -hmm. and get six copper? No, that's not what this game's about, right? But being able to do something like buy off a politician, right? Doing something like being able to buy a boat or buy a castle or something like that. That's that's important. Those are critical plot points in a lot of adventures, and we want to support that. So we're going to have a, a, what we call the wealth mechanic, which is, you know, it's mostly like how much wealth do you have? Three, right? How expensive is this? One, you can just buy it. Right, it's not a you're not actually spending money. You're just measuring how much wealth you have and comparing it to how hard is this thing to get in terms of money, right? And then it might be so expensive you got to make a roll. Oh, we we negotiated well. We negotiated well, got the price down, that kind of thing. And I actually did a lot of work on this for the Chain of Akron. But then after having designed it, I couldn't be arsed to go through everything in the PHB and assign difficulty levels to it basically so instead of cash how much does it cost it's like how hard is it to buy right and then you add your wealth modifier to it and there you go uh, and i was like i can't I, I got i got too much stuff to do so go watch you know i would say most actual plays right most actual plays are heroic fantasy games some of them are specifically mm -hmm. like candela obscura some of them are specifically this one genre and that's super cool more people need to know that role playing is not just heroic fantasy right go watch the Paranoia streams. Those were soup. That was the streams. That was super fun. Um, no dungeon crawling involved. Um, yeah. Adam Scarborough. Oh, you already asked that question. Yes. Uh, I do see a good question about uh, magic items have levels. What's that about? Um, magic items have levels. An yeah. Question answered. Yep. Yeah. As you level up, your your item gets more powerful. It's because we envision right. Like Thor doesn't throw away. You know, Mjolnir because uh, he gets a better weapon, right? Um, or uh, uh, you don't see Frodo throw Sting away because he found a plus two Sting, 
right? And so that idea of like, hey, you have this weapon, it is important to you, and you want to carry it from place to place, uh, is, is where we get that idea of like, the weapon advances with you rather than you finding three different swords and you switch one for the next in your career. Hardly Paranormal says, it seems like more and more D6 systems are cropping up recently. Are there any games that influence some designs? I mean, I was, I mean, I, like, that's, it's very interesting yeah, yeah. to see the response to this where people are like, oh, they're just stealing from this one game that came out last year. And I'm like, motherfucker, yeah. I'm stealing from a game that came out 30 years ago <laughs> yeah. that's older than you. <laughs> right? right. That, yeah. So there have been, we, I've been, I was playing D, I was playing games that use D6 systems to re, I was playing Champions in 1989, which is a 3D6 system, which some people like better because mm -hmm. it's a bell curve. I like it less better. I like the triangle wave. Um, but yeah, D, the, 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 using, using some number of D6s or like D10s or dice pools, none of these things are, are new ideas. There are a couple of new ideas in this. That's not one of them yeah. um so so luke wallace says so this is just fourth edition right that's the kind of person mods in general i would just ban that person <laughs> because like you can't you can't you, i don't think it's i don't think any reasonable person would go oh there's no attack roll in this game therefore it's the same right. as this other <laughs> it's like nope you can't you, you can't cut the shit we cut and say it's the same thing um but it's up to you i don't tell the mods what to do i just you know um See. Now, now is the medita meditative period where James and I read the questions. Yes, exactly. Um, so, I, mean, I think Tunnels and Trolls might have used D sixes. Oh yeah, and Tunnels and Trolls is like from the seventies. Yeah. why do people get worked up about this? I, I got it from Monopoly actually. I was like, this is, there's this great two D six mechanic. Risk. Yeah. <laughs> my friends and I played the shit out of Risk when we were too old to do it. Basically. Oh sure. Um, uh, is it? Oh well, they maybe are hardly paranormal. I, I, I don't mean to call you out, hardly paranormal. Just saying, I think I, I think what's happening is that a lot of people are making new games now, uh, be, for a lot of reasons. One, I think the category is growing, right? I think that more and more people are more and more people are getting turned on to the fact that role playing games are the most fun you can have with your brain. They're social. I think especially in this day and age, people are desperately crave excuses to get together and be. I, I mean, literally, I have friends of mine who are like, I just haven't seen another person in the past three weeks. Let's get together and get lunch or something, right? Um, so people are making new games, and there's a diaspora out of fifth edition. Because I just don't think that it's, you know, it's that, that period during which the community could trick itself into thinking that there was one game to rule them all. Has the, the, that's not true anymore. No one thinks that way anymore. And so we're getting lots of new games. So some of them are absolutely going to be D6-based games. Yeah. Lots of more. We've already got lots of um, D20. New D20 games are coming. Yeah. There's a good question here about, will the system support narratively flexible magical abilities, or are they going to be more hard-coded, right? So essentially, are we going to see things where uh, it's more interpretive between the uh, player and the director? I think for the most part, you're going to see things that are pretty spelled out, but there might be a few things like, uh, you know, for, for instance, the wish spell, uh, where, you know, like that, that kind of thing. I don't imagine you're going to see that in our game. If you do, you're going to see it probably through, like, single-use magic items rather than as a thing a player can do all the time right because those tend to get exhausting for both the player and the director um so we would probably want them to be more things like that or like illusions right can tend to be I, we often talk about how will we make an illusionist work because we don't want it to be a burden to play I, I, I was, I was yeah. thinking about this again the other day and i honestly can't think of a way to do an illusionist that isn't just like a mind control character right right yeah, because yeah. ultimately ultimately what an illusionist is doing is trying to convince someone else that this fake thing is real because they expect it's going to change their behavior. So what they're trying to do is change that person's behavior, right? right. And, yes. and and if you get to if you boil that down, it's basically a certain kind of mind control. And maybe that means we now we know how to do it, but also that kind of feels gross. Mm -hmm. But who knows? Um, yeah, yeah. People are talking about two d six games. Yeah, people are like chainmail used two d six. Yeah, well, there's tons of people out there that are convinced that we only started designing games like last year or something and that we and what's what, the only thing that annoys me about it is how how often these people are like young <laughs> and it's like we've i've been playing games since we've been playing games for a long time we've been playing we play a lot of games will monsters have weaknesses to things i think so yeah. Yeah. yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah yeah um a sword and sorcery archetype oh i mean like a a a, a, a an elric type character mm -hmm. i i have to assume that our game you're gonna be able to play elric in our game i just don't know what class that is yes I know it yeah. might be like somebody was talking about the like James likes I do too by the way it was just his idea the idea that the necromancer can summon um, not just minions but like weapons and stuff like that well now we're talking about a summoner a, a necromancer with a sword um, we have the acolyte idea that we've talked about mm -hmm. we haven't implemented that might be a place you might find an Elric thing we don't know yeah. yeah I mean you know we haven't even discussed all who knows maybe there's a fury who wields magic as a subclass Could be. right like yeah. <laughs> it's all kinds of stuff so yeah um um Let's see. 
Do I see granting XP ex uh, as exponentially instead of linear amount to reward risk riskiness? Well, um, so I don't know that, uh, so XP will probably be something that uh, is going to help reward riskiness in the sense that like, hey, you're gonna wanna keep going because it's only when we rest that these convert into XP. So sure, we could kill something, rest, kill something, rest, kill something, rest, but then it's up to the, you know, the director to say like, okay, well, you're eventually gonna go into a hard battle then with no victories, uh, and you're gonna be sure you'll be pretty fresh, but that may not be great. Or, by the way, the villain is going to advance their plans because you keep resting so yeah. much, right? That's yeah. the risk of resting, is that you have to do it for a long time, so the villain gets to do a lot of stuff. While they're waiting is there a space you. in this game for an evil group of PCs? I mean, it depends on what you mean by evil. Mm -hmm. Because, like, the Chain of Acheron are not evil, but they're also not good guys, right? Mm -hmm. They can be evil if they, if, they, if they feel like that's the most expeditious way to get what they want. Um, but it comes down to stuff like adventures and stuff like that. No, we're not going to make adventures where all these, all these NP, every single NPC in this town, it tells you how much cash they have on them and where they keep their um, valuables. Because we are, we assume that there are going to be thieves in our game that are just going to go through town stealing from these innocent people. No, we don't assume that. We don't build that. We don't build support for that into the game, right? So that's that's kind of it depends on what you mean by evil. Um, there's kind of like melodramatic evil, and then there's kind of cutthroat, cut first cut stuff, and we're not doing that. Um, Let's see. Irish Jesus wants to know: Are my D12s going to still be useless in this game? Yes. Uh, I don't think they're. It's D4s, D6s, D8s. Yep. And maybe we a haven't. Die. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh -huh. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't yet found. A, the only reason we use D4s is because we found a need for bonuses, minor minor bonuses and rewards, or pe bonuses and penalties. So we used a D4. The only reason we use the D8 is because we needed a die for I want to do extra damage with this attack, like a, a, and that's sort of like the impact die. So if we find a need, we don't we don't start with the dice and try to figure out how do we use these. We start with the game design and figure out what do we need. There you go. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, how do you handle skill rolls? You take your dice in your hand, you roll. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, I mean, skill rolls are very similar to what you would find in a D twenty fantasy game. Um, you roll two d six. You add the relevant modifier, um, and you compare it to a target number. Um, so I would say the big thing that we do is we encourage, and, and you can do this in a lot of games, and a lot of games do this, like Vampire the Masquerade, the separation of skill. Um, and characteristic, right? So you roll, you always add your characteristic, and if you have a relevant skill, you could do that. So for instance, if you are trying to intimidate someone, uh, that could be a presence uh, test, right? You're rolling your 2d6, you're adding presence, and you might add intimidate, um, because you are getting in their face and you're trying to be, you know, use your force of personality to overwhelm them. If you are taking a log and breaking it in half with your bare hands to intimidate them with your might, then you would roll 2d6, you would add your might, and still also add your intimidate, right? So we try to encourage a little bit more separation of that to allow people to be creative with skills. Uh, will the Monsters book include monsters des monster design tools? Um, I don't think so, because I don't know how that would work. Like, the way we design monsters is we pay people and say, go make something cool. <laughs> Yeah. So, like, there's not, I, I think that it, it's, 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 I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to be reductive here, but it's almost like saying, will the RPG come with designing your own RPG rules? You could ask that question, right? Somebody who was completely naive and didn't know what an RPG was might ask that and see, like, oh, will I be able to make my own role playing games with your RPG? Mm -hmm. Like, what? Right? So that's like, like, we, we sit and we think, and then we write our ideas down, and then we test them. And how do you, how do you, like, what we, what there might be is, like, there's a, um, a chart in I think the five E DMs guide about like if you want to make a new monster, just use just use it has if it's fifth level, it has this many hit points, it has this bonus to attack, it does this much damage. There might be something like that, um, but yeah. those are that's not that that like if you see some cool ability that the Olathet can do, and you're like, how do I? What are the rules for creating a brand new ability like that that is balanced? There are none. You have imagine you start with imagination, and then you try to instantiate it with uh, the grammar of our rules, and then you test it. So there's no way we can package that up and hand that to you. Yeah, exactly. We might have some advice to that regard, right? But I don't think we'll have any way that's going to say, like, here's how you'll get a perfect level 10 monster that is perfectly balanced. There, uh, there's no way to do that nope. uh, yep. with how, how our game works. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're getting to the end of this. Mm -hmm. How easily do you think the core system might be adapted to other genres? Um well, we have the laser gun fantasy. Uh, it's, it might not be 
on release. Uh, but we already have, like, you'll, hopefully you'll get to meet the operator and stuff like that. So I think, like, Space Fantasy is one of our core three settings. But we're not making a generic system. If we wanted to go make another game, which we would like to do, like, if this game does well and it grows mm -hmm. over time, we'd love to make lots of different games, including maybe other RPGs. Um, I, when I was at Wizards of the Coast, I was a full-time employee in RPG R&D in the year 2000 when they released D&D. Uh, &D. I was in RPG R&D. They don't have this anymore. They have D&D R&D. Right? But they used to make multiple games. That was cool. It was neat. Um, there was a Wheel of Time RPG. I was working on a Dune D20 game that I thought was going to be, we all thought was going to be really cool, but they canceled it. Um, so, like, if we wanted to go make a dungeon crawler, right, we would start at first principles. We would not assume that, therefore, it should be a 2D6 game. Now, it may be that we're like, oh, actually, everything we want to do with this dungeon crawler, we can do with the system we have, in which case we would use that system. But if not, we would, it would be its own thing. Same thing with, like, you know, Dead World Under a Black Star or that kind of thing. Yeah. It's a question about will we have damage over time? Uh, we will. Yep. It's um, a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if, I light you, if I light you on fire, <laughs> that's bad news and you got to do something about it. And that's pretty heroic. Um, are you playtesting every monster? We playtest everything we do extensively. Yeah. Every, every, every monster, every magic item, every character class, every ability goes through multiple rounds of actual real world, get a game together, play scenarios. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. Our testers do a lot of work. A lot of work. Super rigorous and, and key to what we do, for sure. Um, uh, are martial classes, uh, do they have any actions that allow them to do AOE type stuff? Yeah. Um, so, for instance, if you are uh, the Fury, you can do a whirlwind attack um, where you attack everybody within your reach. Ooh, that is a way to do AOE. Now, will they have anything like a fireball? Maybe not, but an archer class, you could see, hey, I get to attack everybody in this square, right? Um, those are the kinds of things that we think about. Is like, okay, if you're a controller, you should be able to control large pieces of the battlefield, which means that, hey, maybe I get this uh, something that functions akin to an AOE. Um, so you will see that sort of thing uh, in the martial classes. You will probably see it more in some of the supernatural classes because it's easier to imagine, right? It's it, And it fits more of their fantasy, but it's certainly not out of the question for martial classes. Do we have, James Cashman says, mm -hmm. do we have any interest in making board games? Well, we sort of have to make a board game, otherwise our art director is going to punch me in the face. <laughs> um, like, I, I, the only way I was able to recruit our art director, Jason Hasenow, was by promising him that we would make a dungeon crawling board game. Now, don't get your hopes up. That's like, when I say dungeon crawling board game, it's probably going to be sci-fi. Like, mm -hmm. imagine, like, think of, like, exploring derelict spaceships kind of thing. Um, when that will happen, uh, no idea. But actually, those of you who don't know this, like, what we are trying to do is the hardest thing to do in gaming. Like, every other kind of game, Mm -hmm. Video games, indie, big, big, small. Video games, board games, card games, miniature war games are all easier to make money on than RPGs. RPGs are incredibly different, difficult to kind of like, as they say, monetize. So at some point, we got to make a board game. Otherwise, Jason's going to be upset. Yeah. Oh, wow. Backer kit website is struggling. Oh, How many boy. sessions do we expect players to spend at first level? It's a great question, Dr. Paxmore. Um, uh, Dr. Paxmore, a longtime member of the community. Oh, um, cool. I don't know. Like, um, I imagine the we haven't done a lot of work on this yet mm -hmm. because we're just working on the core rules. But I imagine that I, I think of the basic unit of uh, adventuring as the adventure, which is I think of as a 32 to 64 page booklet. <laughs> right. So go back to the 80s and go look at things like Lost Cavern of Sojkanth and stuff like that. And it's like that's about right. 32 to 64 pages should be one adventure, and that's one level. So you can answer that question. How long do you think it should take to get through one adventure if one adventure is not a huge hardcover book? Mm -hmm. No, just a 32 to 64 page bite sized thing. My expectation is four to six sessions. Right. The four to six sessions is an adventure, and that's a level. And you level up at the end of the adventure. Yeah. So that's, it may be that once we actually start testing whole adventures, we find there are reasons to do it differently. But until we get there. Uh, Artie Mouse says, are we going out of our way to prevent game-breaking combos of player abilities, or is that more left to the social contract? Um, so we will be, I mean, we'll be looking at that stuff with the testers. Yeah. Here's the thing, is that... Sometimes game-breaking combos can be very fun, mm -hmm. right? And that, to me, is not game-breaking. So it, there's a question of, we want you to be able to do combos that are super cool and powerful. Yeah. What we don't want you to do is, we do this every single fight, and it works every single time, and yeah. that's all we should do, and that's the way you win the game, right? Yeah. We don't want the game to be winnable. Uh, correct. Or solvable. Yeah, solvable. Right? Where there's a yeah, solution yeah. where you'd like, only ever do this, because it's the only thing that's good. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
why are RPGs more difficult? Because once you buy the books, you don't need to spend any more money, yeah. right? And and the amount of the amount of work it takes to make the art, for instance, for an RPG is unbelievable compared to a board game or a card mm-hmm. game. It's like holy crap! It's a lot. It's a lot of art and design and testing. Because think about think about what you do in a board. Imagine any board game like Gloomhaven. Imagine what you do in Gloomhaven. Mm-hmm. Compare that to what you can do in an RPG. It's off the charts, right? Gloomhaven, any board game is a constrained set of problems. It, that makes it relatively easy, straightforward and easy to solve compared to an RPG where you can, you know, you could decide to build a spaceship if you wanted to and go to another planet, right? Okay, where are the rules for that? Oh, God, right? So it's, it's as far as bang for buck goes in terms of the amount of money it takes to make a good one and then the revenue that generates is off. The, it's the worst possible. It's the hardest thing to do. We are trying to do the hardest thing to do in gaming. And so the fact that you folks are interested means maybe maybe it'll work. Uh, there is a good question about does does your answer mean that we're planning on putting out a bunch of thirty six page adventures? Uh, and I mean, here's what I will say: right now we develop uh, adventures. We are developing adventures so that people can play test the game, right? Yeah. The monsters, the mechanics, that kind of thing. Um, if we have the time, we would like to go back and further develop those adventures, right? Once the rules are in a good place, it's like, okay, well now we should, and where those go, where those will end up, if we will publish them, if we won't, that's all to be determined. But we'll have a lot of adventure content yep. that we could publish uh, if we have the man so, time, manpower to do it. Here's the answer. Mm-hmm. It, it takes about 300 pages of content for anything we do to be worth going to print with. Correct. Right. So, like printing a sixty-four page adventure, we're probably not going to do that, uh, ex- with the exception of inside a box set. Inside a box set, well, now we can do whatever we yeah. want, right? Because what you're buying is the box set. But otherwise, if it's not about three hundred pages worth of rules or more, then it's not worth us going to print for. So, I think you're going to see lots of adventures that are PDFs, Correct. right? Uh, lots of adventures in the VTT, right? Lots of third-party adventures that we promote. That we're like, yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you guys did that. You want to sell it on our store? That kind of thing. Um, but actual in print, 36 to 64 page adventures, no. Probably, so when you're thinking in your head about what kind of physical uh, products might be in a future line, um, you gotta think about your idea and be like, is that a 300 page idea? Uh, they're probably not gonna do it in print. They'll probably do it as a PDF. And I'm sort of philosophically opposed, I'm sure we'll do one sooner or later if things, mm-hmm. if, if, if we have continued success over time. I'm sort of philosophically opposed to the anthology hardcover because it makes it really hard for the director, me, the one spending the money, to figure out what, what's in there. Do I want those adventures, right? If there's eight adventures in there, how do I know, do, am I gonna use all eight of those adventures? Mm-hmm. I would rather see all eight of those adventures broken out as their own thing that I can look at and be like, yeah, that's the one I want for tonight. And that's what a campaign is, by the way, a campaign. The idea of a campaign comes from the notion of linking several adventures together. And how you, you so, so no two campaigns should be the same, right? Because the adventures you uniquely picked to put next to each other, I, in a good, robust ecology, maybe no other director has run those adventures mm-hmm. in that order. So uniquely your players have gone on this campaign. I love that stuff. I also like big box adventures, by the way. I love oh, yeah. the idea of doing like a Corsicef the Infinite adventure, a Cithrion or Onizir adventure, or like a tour of the Timescape adventure where it's a big fuck off box set with tons of cool stuff in it. And it takes you from first to 10th level. Mwah! I love that stuff. I just don't like it when that's the only option. Uh-uh. Um, that's the kind of thing that probably would be better for a box set. Mm-hmm. We haven't really checked out. That's we'll, we'll all find out together what the future of box sets is in this, um, in this RPG because now we're on the hook to make one or at least to pay somebody to make one. And we'll find out, does it sell well? Does it not sell that well? We don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ace Wheelie wants to know, will there be an encounter building template? Uh, there will be rules for building encounters. We definitely want yeah. to make that easy for you. Um, so those will probably be in the monster book. Yeah. Cool. We love you, Tina Price. Thank you for the, that's a, that's a lot of money. Uh, Tina Price yeah. is doing okay. Thank you for the 50 bucks. Thank you, Tina Price. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You don't have to throw money at us to get us to answer questions. I, we're all we're, we're looking at chat. It's just there's a lot of people mm-hmm. in chat. Um, is there going to be a mini adventure in the books? Um, I don't think so. No, but because it... that's where's that? That's uh, you know we got we only got 400 pages of of core rules, 400 pages mm-hmm. of monsters. 
do you want us to spend 64 of those pages on an adventure when by the time and by the time those books come out there'll be lots of adventures to play right the the pdfs coming out is like the last thing that's going to happen right. the license will be out way before that we'll have uh, I, cross your fingers we will have already gone to the backers with um play test packets mm -hmm. and stuff at which point the backers will be making content so yeah we're we've already contracted freelancers who work with us to start converting stuff from flea mortal so mm -hmm. it's 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 all going to happen. It's just not going to be in those in those hardcovers. Yeah, exactly. So and and who knows? It may be that like maybe one of those adventures is available for free if we need yeah, to sure. decide you need a starter adventure. Can you come to our site yeah, and download the it? Yeah, Delian Tomb Plus Plus. Yeah. yeah. Is the game only going to exist as a VTT? No. No. On your proprietary VTT? Oh, oh, will you be able to? I mean, we don't own. Um, I think folks get there uh, don't mm -hmm. understand the ecology. We don't own Foundry. They don't. They don't belong to us. We don't own Roll Twenty. Our content on their platforms is largely up to them and their community. We don't have a lot to do with it. It, it depends on a, on a on a on a VTT by VTT basis, which is one of the reasons that we like uh, we rather mm -hmm. we think we can give our audience the best experience if we're in charge of this. Um, so on a case by case basis, they each have different rules for how you get stuff on there. But it's mostly up to the community or them. Uh, we think you know, we're going to have an open license. Anybody who wants to will be able to instantiate our rules and a lot of our content in whatever VTT you like. Uh, we just think our VTT, the experience of using our VTT will be better. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, I saw a uh, good question about, um, uh, let's see, t -t -t where I just had it. Um, well, oh, 2D6 scaling for levels. Um, so the answer for that good is question. that um, as you level up, um, you will be able to, with your uh, attacks, be adding impact dice, which are 1d8s, um, or which are just d8s, I should say, because you could add more than one uh, to your higher level powers as you unlock them. Um, and probably at some point it'll be like, hey, you're, you either get more attacks or your your single attack gets more powerful, that kind of thing. So you will be able to deal out more damage as you get higher. Um, and it will also be that your bonuses to that will get higher uh, for things that you use outside of combat. You might get impact dice on skill checks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're getting close to the end because I'm seeing a lot of questions that we've already answered in this chat. Yes. Um, yeah, I think this is probably close to it. Uh, King Girk says, you said access to the VTT will likely cost a monthly fee. Well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, will that be director only? Well, we've already, yeah, we, we already talked about the idea that um, that the, the we don't know. We, we would like it if there was a free version with a small subset of the rules that people could jump into. And like, imagine a, a basic rules for our game mm -hmm. and you and just use those basic rules, maybe even create stuff without having to spend any money. We've thought about the idea of the director paying for it and their players just getting to pay for free. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. What we are pretty sure of is that the patrons aren't going to have to spend any more money to get and use the VTT. That's where that monthly fee talk comes from. The patrons are already paying eight bucks a month. So they're going to get to use the VTT and all of its features without spending any more money. If you're not a patron at that point, we don't know. Is it going to be some yeah. combination of there's a free free space and then a paid space? Is it you pay once and use it forever? We don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. It's a good question. It might be pay once and that's it. You just mm -hmm. pay 40 bucks and there you go. You got the VTT and we'll see. We'll find out. It gets really hard. It gets really hard because what happens is, especially with something of a VTT, it's not like a, a calculator app where you download it once and you don't you, you expect it to do everything, right? We're going to be creating more content for the VTT over time because we're going to be creating more content for our RPG over time, which means people are going to expect the VTT to update and to get more robust over time and do things, and that costs money, right? So that's where the monthly fee idea comes from: is that people don't expect. There are some things we pay a monthly fee for where it's like, where's that money going? Like, what's like, you're not doing any more work, right? Uh, like Photoshop and stuff like that, where it's like, let me just buy the fucking thing, right? But there's this other software, and I definitely think a VTT is one of that, where the people paying for it expect it to get better and grow over time, and where does that money come from? Well, that's the monthly fee. So I'm not saying there's going to be a monthly fee. We don't know. I'm just saying we already know the patrons who are paying a monthly fee are going to get it. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Uh... T -t -t uh, are there limitations on magic item use? Uh, right now, we don't know the answer to that. Um, will there be mechanical tools for the political pillar beyond negotiation? E probably not in the core, necessarily. Wait, ask that again. Are there going to be... Mechanical tools for the political pillar oh. beyond negotiation. I think negotiation yeah, is its own pillar. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And um, politics is a core 
part of my personal D and D games and things I run in Vasloria mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But it's not in our core rulebook. Vasloria, I think you'll get pol- you'll get more robust. Some of the stuff from Kingdoms of Warfare Strongholds and Followers you'll see in Vasloria, in Vasloria. because that's a better impl- instantiation of it. There were things I wanted to do with the politics products we made, Strongholds, Followers, Kingdoms, and Warfare, that I didn't feel like I could do because I don't know what world you're playing in. So I don't know the scale and scope of your game. You know, Mm -hmm. rules for armies marching around a continent, not that useful if you're playing in a local area that's 24 miles across, right? So having a specific setting, in this case, Vasloria, means we can take some of the rules we've already developed and give them teeth because now now those rules know what setting they're for. Right, so that's probably a Vasloria box set product. The negotiation is its own pillar, we think. Yeah. Uh, lots of people asking about homebrew settings. I've seen. Yes, it will be easy to run your game in a homebrew setting. A- yeah. Any anything that has you know anything you got dragons and elves and dwarves and you'll be able to use you'll these be able to use more. these rules. Yeah. yeah. Um, I cool. think this is a good. I don't know if Jerry yeah. can hear us because I think Jerry's in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. But, but I now th- it seems like a good time to stop. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, the thing is, James and I are both online. All the time. All the time. Uh, James is online once a week on his own channel. I stream. Yep. I'm going to deliberately. Uh, some people aren't going. I hope. I hope a lot of people aren't going to care about this. But I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to stream and be a public persona less and less. I had to sort of amp it up a little bit for the crowdfunder, and then I don't want to just disappear. But I don't want this game's not about me, <laughs> right? And so there's a lot of people who you know they're they they want the answer from Uncle Matt, and it's like no no this game has to live or die on its own merits. You know me being enthusiastic for it. I better be enthusiastic for it. It's it's the game I'm looking forward to playing um, and running. I, I, I would love to go back to the chain. I would love to go back to Dusk uh, once this game is robust enough and if my friends are, are available. Uh, but apart from that, I don't I don't I don't want to be the spokesperson for this game. I don't want to be the public face of development. Um, I want to. Pr- we want to promote what you folks are doing. We want other people in the community. There's already a podcast. There's already a, the there's somebody made a one of our somebody in the community made a podcast. Very cool. cool. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, no, we're gonna de- fables D twenty. We definitely have our own. We have our own. We have our own elves, and Jason's already done some visual design there. And you're gonna see. By the way, you're gonna see a lot of crazy, dope ass new shit. Y'all don't know what's coming. If we get the Memonek and the Protean in here, if we get, if we, there's so much cool stuff that we want to put in this game. Um, but it takes a long time to do unique, original visual design. Like it took Jason the better part of. I don't know, four or five months just to figure out what that dwarf looks like. And by the way, if you want to know what a steel dwarf looks like, I think the steel dwarf is that chiaroscuro kind of two-color image in the lower right of the dwarf spread. I think that's a mm-hmm. space dwarf. Um, so I don't know if Jerry can hear us. He can. He knows. Okay, good. Yes. I think now would be a good time to stop. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for funding us. <laughs> and we will see you later. Yeah, you'll see us soon. Peace out, everybody. Bye.